Hi there guys and welcome to another Train Sim 2018 video. Today's train needs no introduction, nor does the route, we've travelled it many times, but I haven't done many APT videos as much as I love it. <laughs> um, I, I, there just hasn't been the scenarios out there for me to, to really do a good video on it and do some talking about the history of the APT and what it was and how it came to be and all that sort of jazz. Then this scenario came out a few months ago uh, on the Steam Workshop. It's 1 Sierra 6 9, I think it is. We'll have a look properly when we get into it. Uh, I can't remember who did it. I got it that long ago. I'd have to go back and look and I haven't had the time to do that, but I will put it in the description below. Um, and I thought, nice run, good AI. Time. It's pretty time correct by the looks of it. Um, I don't know how accurate the AI is, timetable, and that must be a bit. Sh shoddy from this area I suppose but it, it's good enough for me to do this with and I enjoy it so I started playing it and then I noticed that with the short set that was originally in the scenario that the tilt was a bit off and it was very bouncy so I'm hoping now I've put the 16 car stretch set on we should be in luck um, I've got some bits of paper to go through I've got even some manual stuff I think I might go through if I get time I will be covering the APT fully and doing a absolutely full in-depth video of the APT with some real-life stuff thrown in as well once I've been up to see it in February. I was supposed to get up to see it in January. I haven't had the time or the money to get up there to do it, so therefore this is the first video I'm going to do of it properly. I've done the quick look and the start for the people that were having issues. Um, I'm unsure if there's been an update for it out yet. I haven't looked through the, the dev logs and everything to see, and the change logs, sorry, to uh, see it has been we'll find out when we get driving it so let's not beat around the bush let's get going uh we are in a cold and dark state we will get going though so the first <coughs> thing we want to be doing is shift and b to turn on the batteries then we've got the battery on up there then we'll shift m to insert the master key and then we need to put the auxiliary the handle into auxiliaries cancel the AWS uh, then we're going to press the pan up button which is P until we get our line light there we go next thing we're going to do here is start the micro auto sets that's done and then I'm going to release the handbrake that's off that's correct cancel the CAPC system Wait for the speed light to go out. Excellent. Okay. Just got the brakes out of emergency. Just so we're a little bit quicker to, to pull off when we get time. So yeah, as I said, this is the stretch version. This is the 16 car set. So it's a fair length here in Preston on the way up to Carlisle. And we will be calling up today. Lancaster, Oxenholm, Penrith and then Carlisle 1715. So it's about an hour and a quarter drive. Nice amount of time to talk about what I need to do and all that jazz. Next, let me sort out lights. Tail lights off, marker lights on, and we want our right hand light on for now. Safety systems are all on. Pop that down to have a look, they're all in place. Very nice, very, very nice car. Oh, well, my door's not open for some reason. That's a bit odd. Oh well. No worries, doesn't need to be open anyway because we're going to make it move. So, with the, the motor alternators here, we could have started up the diesel one, but that would have given us reduced power and it would also not enable tilt or CAPT. while I put some papers together and make sure I've got everything where I need it. I'm not getting drive guard buzz because I've been out of the cab, but we will get going. It's a 
very, very smooth power application in the APT. And it's, it's rapid, it's a very, very quick, quick train. Loving some of the BR Blue stuff. I'm not, I'm not a massive fan of the BR Blue era. Um, I say I'm not a massive fan, I just don't do much of it really. Oh, there'll be a couple of bonky things like that, unfortunately, where I've uh, messed up in Railworks tools. <laughs> Where did you stand for me? So the real scenario doesn't look like that. What it was is I didn't have the 101 when I originally did this. So I had to swap it out for the 105. I thought I'd fixed it. Well, I obviously haven't. And I've not restarted the video again because this is about the tenth time I've done it. So I do apologise for the creator of this, uh, of this uh, scenario. It's my botched work on some of the AI here. The APT come online now. Let's just really like some brighten it up a little bit. What's the tilt packs coming online? that 70s look of what the future would look like about it and that 70s 80s look like that is something really enough. Very good time up to 110 there. So I'm going to start with my personal reasons for loving the APT and then I'll go into like the details about it. I've got a really good book that's um, with the BR book books by David Gibbons in here. And uh, he's got some nice words to say about it, quite some detailed bits about it, and it explains it very, very well. Um, my personal love of the APT stems from being a child of the 80s and growing up in the late 80s and early 90s. Any train book that you bought at that time, I'm sure I've said this before, had the APT on the cover, or it was the cover girl of train books, British train books, in that era, just because it was meant to be the future. Uh, it, it sort of shared pride of place with the TGP, um, the original ones, the PSE ones, or whatever were, and also the prototype of the TGP as well, the gas turbine version, that was uh, quite often in the white books. But the APT for me was the British one, that was the one that I really wanted to do. And my other reason for it is my dad actually very luckily got a chance to go to the APT uh, years and years ago. Uh, from Glasgow Central down to Houston as a passenger, not as any sort of press or anything like that. So he always told me that he was very proud to have been on it, to be fair. My dad's not a train driver by any way, shape or form. So I've sort of first hand experience, first hand, second hand experience of what it was like to be on it. Just always fascinating. Always fascinating. The other thing I love is I love a bit of a I don't know what to call them, technical blunders, technical I don't really want to call them failures, but uh, things that were meant to revolutionise the world never quite did in the way they were expected to. Uh, Sinclair C5 for example. Uh, I've bought, sold, collected, restored those for years and years. Um, Concord. No, it was quite successful, but the numbers were never as successful as they should have been. <coughs> so, I like the rarity and the scarcity of how these things were used and driven. Seen in the public eye, really. 
I mean, the project was massively underfunded. Uh, they used very novel ideas of putting aircraft engineers and to use aircraft technology on the railways and basically start from scratch, which I think is just such a bold move. And probably part of the reason why it's failing. Um, and I say failing now in the, in the loosest possible terms. In my eyes, the APT people was not a failure. Um, did it actually do what it was meant to do? No. It didn't revolutionise travel on the West Coast mainline at the time it was meant to. Did it revolutionise travel on the West Coast mainline further on? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. It was actually the Pepperinos. So it did kind of fill all the gap of what it needs to do. And of course from the APT came one of my favourite trains of all time, which is the Class London Run. The APT and the Class London Run show a lot of technology, a lot of uh, the lessons learned in the APT in the project meant that the Class London Run project went as well as it did. And that was about the management of how it was run and it being outside contractors that were taking charge of it, which were buying it off there and that sort of thing. It sort of set the way for how trains were procured in the future. And even now with privatisation, we still have a very similar system we had with the, with the last night of the So, groundbreaking more than just a bunch of So, I'll start with the, the, the David Gibbons work. I think this sort of smells it out as best as possible. Um, a really good view of what was going on and, and what the APT was actually about. So it starts with one of the less happy episodes of British Rail history is the story of the advanced passenger train. The desire to accelerate in city centres, particularly on the London, busy London Glasgow route, was hampered by the nature of the in the 19th century, which includes not only the steep gradients, but more importantly numerous sharp curves, which impose severe speed restrictions on conventional locomotives and stock. Since there was no prospect of being able to build new sections of high speed railway, it was decided to design to design a new train which would travel safely at high speeds of up to 155 miles per hour on conventional tracks. The problem with negotiating curves was to be resolved by developing a device which would enable the vehicles to tilt. In addition, a new braking system was required to cut the greatly increased speeds in tender. So that's the big point, we always think about just getting there fast, don't we? <laughs> we don't often think about stopping. Um, but these guys didn't want to be engineers, they do that sort of thing all the time. Initially, an experimental gas turbine powered unit was built in the APT, which is still around as a shield at the moment, which ran trials in the western and London Midland region between 1973 and 1976, setting a British rail speed record of 151 miles per hour in Disney. The third of August 1975. It was now preserved for the National Railway Museum. Uh, that's the shielding of the big section there now, not the York. And I say preserved, it's at their rotting. So, for far too long. Uh, after APT, the basic theory of the project is the 314 car prototype electrically powered 18 sets were built. All these things did not always run in a consistent formation. Whilst APT had been powered by two driving power cars positioned in the of the train, the electric ATPP had power cars marshalled within the sets. I'm speaking of so. Passengers were not able to pass through the power car, and the train was thus divided into two parts. ATPP differed in several other quite major respects from APT, including a great new revised design of tilt suspension. After testing with the power cars, the first prototype train ran in February 1979. So that's early in it. We think of this as a beast of the 80s. February 1979, that's what's saying about it being a design book. The design book is definitely very similar. So it's February 1979, in December of that year, the British record 162 miles per hour was achieved, which still stands to this day uh, by 19, oh no, 19, 160. Now, hang on, I've got to check that because I don't think the 91 is the fastest locomotive, isn't it? I think the 162 might still be one of the records held. But the APT still holds some records, but it's that late on. By 1980, all three APT were running, 
there were repeated difficulties with certain features, including the tilt suspension, the hydraulic method, and the class brake systems. So there's your, there's your main, one of your main technological problems with the ABCB was actually the class brakes. So while this has got a hydrokinetic brake, it also has standard brake box acting on the rim. It's higher as it is, uh, as a class brake system. Because of the problems encountered with the ATPP units, as well as changing views of the BR management. <laughs> so remember the guy Reed the the right this state he did a lot of work for them with their manuals. I think 99% of the manuals I own from all the illustrations and stuff are done by David Gibbons. This is going to be slightly complimentary here. Uh, so, as well as changing the views of the BR management as to what sort of train was required, the concept of the ATP fixed formation train sets was eventually abandoned. Instead of new Mark 4 coaches with tilting mechanism based on the ABT design, uh, these had to be built for the West Coast service. These were all separately by non tilting class 9 to an electrolyte person. So it came with not the tilting fires to be other ones. Also, what a lot of people don't really remember realise is that we also got the HST because of it as well. The HST was a product of the APT. Now, I've heard different stories telling different things. The, the one I like to believe that hope is true the best is that basically the guys in the British Rail were a bit miffed that all these aircraft engineers were brought in to do this. And uh, at a board meeting when they were discussing the delays of why the APT wasn't as far ahead as it should have been, and this and that, a couple of the rail boats back just sort of turned around and went, well, we can give you 125 mile an hour diesel train and we can do it in a year. And I think we are basically said, oh no, you won't be able to do it. And then they sort of said, okay, go for it. And that's how we got the HST. How true that story is, I don't know. Uh, do I like it? Yeah, I think it's a great one still. I think it's said, I really do hope it's true. One of those very fabled tables of the British Rail industry. And I've heard it from several sources as well, and you've got a documentary on it, I think. Um, so, you never know. There's lots of uh, myths and lip stories like this that are around about back to steep days. See, maybe, really, one of the things that came out of the APT project that we were just never told about was the um, SDO operation. <laughs> that would only be for me, changing things like this. I'm not sure if this would particularly have been a passenger stop or it could have just been that it was stopped there for signalling purposes or testing purposes. That oh, was a 58, look.
don't know if you ever got 58s up this far north at this time, to be fair. Those off. This will be where I've edited the, the train. Should have flipped it around the other way. Alright, we're clear to go again. So the boost feature, interesting little bit of kit here. So it has this boost notch, it can be used for 20 seconds. Uh, only works up to, oh, I want to say 30 mile an hour, but I think, yeah, I think it's 30 mile an hour it works up to. Um, there's a video on YouTube of a guy that used to drive the ATP. ATP, APT. Um, and he's very, clear about the acceleration of the, the APT. So he tells the story of standing at Scout Green, which is halfway up the shack, and him going into boost, and him being doing 80 mile an hour at the top of the shack, from standing. So that's a pretty, pretty quick train, isn't it? Pretty quick train. Oh, we haven't got drivers at this end either. I haven't swapped it round. That was really silly of you, Al. Very pretty cabin using this train as well. It's a really nice idea for the cab. It's a nice colour for it. I don't know what made them specifically go for blue. I don't know. But I like it. So, the Class 370, the advanced passenger train. The Class 370 is a 14 car train. The formation consists of two non driving motor cars marshalled in the centre of two identical brakes of six trailers. As passengers are not allowed to pass through the motor cars, all train facilities, including catering, are duplicated in each way. Motor cars are continuously rated up to 4,000 horsepower, giving a total of 8,000 horsepower for traction. Trailer cars are of an admirable construction. Strips, extrusions, extrusions of aluminium that's 24 inches wide and are welded together to form the body shell. Underneath is a central key to which the underframe equipment is fitted. Individual coaches are of a lightweight and trailer open second, for example, weighs an unloaded weight of only 24 tons. So that is pretty light. Uh, so, this is to give you a comparison here, so compare that to a 34 tonne for a Mark III coach. So it's 10 tonnes lighter than a Mark III. 10 tonnes. <laughs> I mean, that's not just a little bit, is it? That's a fair weight. Uh, trailer cars are 21 metres long, and it's 23 for a Mark III, so they are slightly shorter. Vickers uh, yet, I think the 21 meters are the same number of seats as in an HST coaches. Windows are double glazed, larger than those fit to HSTs, obviously already. So I mean that's already pretty good isn't it? The, the windows are even bigger. Mark three. 
The air conditioning is of a special energy saving design with some high proportion of recycled air. The toilets are, a lot, are of the chemical recirculating type. I didn't know that. It's sort of like portaloos. Not like vacuum ones that we have today or uh, controlled emission flush ones. I wonder how that works. Uh, all doors are slightly plug tight, power operated. When they close the flush, the fixed flush into the door openings. Passengers can open the doors, open and close doors, but only when the guard has given a proper release of his control panel. So a little bit of time back here. Aren't these things beautiful? A nice time. So those of you that this question pop up, how did you get the passenger view in the APT? Um, the APT does have passenger view, passenger view, but only in the 16 car set, the 14 car set. I don't think it does on the 7 car set. Uh, the guard himself can open and close all doors simultaneously. Behind the driver's cab is a diesel alternator set to provide electrical power in an emergency or where the train is being towed, in cases where the contact line is lost or isolated from the railway. Marshal next to the motor coach is a train awake first. This contains a first class saloon, a guard's office, and a luggage area with equipment bay in the rear. Here is to be found a motor, a motor, a motor alternator. Set in the rake's main air compressor. Between the driver trailer second and the trailer brake first are four other trailers, one second class, a catering vehicle, and unclassified trailers for use as restaurant and an open first. Public address equipment is installed for use by the guard to the on train chef or steward. Provision is made for the trailer brake first for an individual chair attendant. Oh, there you go. Oh, see, this is a little bit wobbly still. This is something I really hope they can fix. So nice. Aircon is way too loud in the cab. <laughs> way, way too loud in the cab. I'm actually going to cut the gain volume a little bit just so you definitely can hear my voice. It saves me reading all of this and you guys not hearing what I'm wobbling on about. So this little bad boy in the corner here, this is the CAPT system. And CAPT stands for Control Advanced Passenger Train. A revolutionary aid to drivers based on microprocessor, uh, microprocessor technology, the CAPT, a speed limit device mechanism fitted in the cab. The men who drive the APT will also drive conventional trains over the same route. Yet APT is allowed to exceed speed limits by a substantial margin. To prevent confusion, speed limits are displayed automatically in the APT's cab. See, oh, there we go, see APT kicking in now, and I'm not clicked on the game, there we go. 115 anyway, which I was hoping to get down to. Down to 105, and then I'll continue reading.
Right, so we were saying the men who drive the APT will also drive conventional trains over the same routes. Yeah, APT is allowed to exceed speed limits by a substantial margin. To prevent confusion, speed limits are displayed automatically in the APT cab. CAPT leaves the driver firmly in control of the train, but gives him a digital advance warning on his desk of the higher APT speed limits. On the track, on the track beacons, called transponders, store permanent speed limit information in coded form, sealed in glass fibre reinforced cases. The transponders contain, containing electronics and a loop aerial are waterproof and need no external power supply. The transponders are powered by radio beam transmitted by a loop and aerial under the front of the train. A coded message is retransmitted by the transponder and fed to the train born process unit. So think of this as a bit, from what I can understand it works a bit like um, RFID. So like if you've got a little RFID chip, I don't know if you haven't forget indoors at work or uh, anything like that. Some gyms and social clubs I know have uh, RFID access and things like that. So. The radio waves are sent out by a aerial underneath the train and that goes around a big coil and makes powers and sends enough creates enough power to be able to um, emit a signal back to whatever the device is. So for doors, the chip itself that you have on your keys has no battery in it or anything like that. But what that will do is get power from the door when it goes near the thing, excites all the I can't really describe it in electronic terms, but it works. <laughs> That's what it does with this. So this was way before Arthur's stuff was out for anything, I would think. This thing does make short work of the West Coast Main Line. You don't, Joe. Sometimes I wish I read things before, <laughs> before I do it, because it now goes on to explain what I've just explained. But this will explain it better. The transponders are powered by a radio beam transmitted by a loop aerial under the front of the train. Coded message retransmitted by the transponder and fed to the train brain processor unit. Microprocessing circuits check the, vali vali the validity of the code and display the approaching speed limit to the driver. When the train approaches a speed restriction. The display changes to the new limit at the approaching braking point. An audible warning sound, which the driver must acknowledge, otherwise the brakes are applied automatically. The driver selects a suitable braking rate to bring the speed down to the new limit displayed. At the start of the restriction, indicator light on the desk has, is briefly illuminated, while at the end he receives a short warning sound to alert him that the higher speed that he can now travel at a higher speed. So we'll give it give it the beans when we leave here. CAPT has to fail safe, so transponders are bolted to the sleepers at intervals of less than a mile. If the equipment fails to respond to a transponder, the display goes blank and an audible warning is initiated which must be acknowledged by the driver. 
With a blank display, the driver reverts to conventional speeds. To eliminate the risk of wrong speed limits being displayed, all the train board equipment, except for the display, is duplicated, while the electronic system has an inbuilt self checking routine, which is pretty nice. A secondary use of the CAPT is to close air intakes approaching tunnels to prevent ear discomfort to passengers. Nice little feature that is, isn't it? So because they'll be slightly pressurised when you get the pressure going through the tunnel, it's when you get the ear pop. I think Mark IVs have a similar system as well, but it's not done by transponder. I think it's done by pressure itself. But I may be wrong on that. They're really doing my head in today. So another amazing feature of the, the APT was of course the hydrokinetic brake and that's something I'll go through now with you. So the braking system installed on the APT known as hydrokinetic or HK for short is a unique system using water, water, uh, a water glycol mixture to create a braking effect on the axles. APT's particular braking problem was to bring the train to a halt from its highest speed within the same distance as the conventional 100 mile per hour trains so as to allow the existing signal spaces to remain. The HK brake uses a relatively simple principle. A water reservoir is connected by flexible pipes and a torque reaction tube to a chamber inside the hollow axles. Let's just go off the power there. Notch two, how's that holding? It's not. Notch three is probably gonna be a bit over the top. So it has a reaction to a chamber inside the hollow axles. Inside the chamber is a stationary stator in the form of a disc with a cup-shaped erasus arranged on its surface linked to the hollow axle and the wheels, so and thus the wheels, uh, is a rotating rotor with a shape and form similar to the stator. The rotor and the stator run side by side with cups facing each other. During braking, a controlled air pressure is introduced above the water mixture in the reservoir, which forces the water into the chamber, where it is picked up by the cups of the rotor and impelled against the stationary cups on the surface of the stator. This action causes the rotor and the wheels to slow down. The water follows the circular path inside the cups and in doing so, regenerates heat in the water ro rotation of the rotor pumps out of them. What? Whoa! Let me read that again. The water follows a circular path inside the cups and in doing so generates heat in the water. Rotation of the rotor pumps, rotation of the rotor pumps out the water to the water reservoir where it is cooled by a cooling system. Seven brake steps are provided plus an emergency stop. The movement of the driver's brake controller is transmitted electronically along the train. Now that was a mouthful, wasn't it? I hope you heard that over the, the noisy pack. We'll give your ears a little bit of a break for a minute while we're dithering up Shap here. So the APT bogies, nice time to be using them really, isn't it? Because we're listening to them now. APT uses three types of bogies. An end trailer bogie, which is a BT12, is used under the driving trailers and trailer brake first vehicles with an articulated bogie, the BT11, to link the intermediate trailer coaches. Coil springs support the bogey frames, the coach bodies being suspended on air suspension units. These air springs, designed to keep the floor and individual vehicles level had to reduce, and to reduce noise transmission, are located on the extreme ends of the BT-11 bogies and on the centre line of the BT-12 bogey frames. Most cars use a heavier bogey, the BP-17, but with a nest of coil springs for body support. All three bogies are of steel construction with hydraulic dampers. The tilt and suspensions, here's like the main bit of, of what made APT really, really special. Well, one of the many things that made APT quite special.
Uh, we missed a CAPT acknowledgement alarm, so we're now showing you how fast this thing can break. Incredibly quickly. So this is us going to also be able to show you the boost function, which is quite a nice thought. So this is us in boost, a 1 in 99. See that? that CAPT intervention. It was completely planned. I planned it right from the beginning. <laughs> so we can see the phenomenal turn of speed on this thing. Right, advances in the vehicle suspension design can make high speeds possible on curved sections, but not without considerable discomfort to passengers. Unless the vehicle itself is allowed to tilt, said tilt and the tilt inverters in the aircon come on and make a racket. Tilting the coach body can minimise lateral acceleration, maintaining passenger comfort and allow the train to negotiate curved track sections at higher speeds than would be permitted by conventional non-tilting trains. APT's tilting bodies are suspended on an air suspension unit carried by a swinging bolster. As each vehicle enters a curve, the tilt system measures automatically the amount of body tilt necessary to minimise side thrust as to maintain comfort levels. This measurement is conveyed to valves between hydraulic oil pump and tilt jacks isolated on the bogies. I said isolated on the bogies, that was located on the bogies, not isolated. But isolated, they wouldn't be working. Uh, the valve opens, moving the jack until the required amount of tilt is achieved and afterwards the valve closes, locking the tilt jacks in position. Once clear of the curve, the tilt jacks are unlocked, thus restoring the vehicle body to an upright position. Uh, up to 9 degrees of tilt is possible. The power car tilts round curves in the same way as the passenger vehicles. The pantograph, however, is maintained in contact with the overhead wire by a tilt compensation linkage. APT is lightweight coupled with its ability, because of its tilt, to run through curves so much faster is that less energy is wasted. In fact, an ATP, uh, APT, I'm, I'm going to have said that about a billion times, uh, an APT uses one third less energy at 125 miles per hour than a diesel HST at the same speed. Wow. It's pretty damn mad, isn't it? Pretty bad. Let's get it back up speed again now. It's the APT that comes with the train sim. It has its faults, don't get me wrong. As did the real thing. But all in all, it's, it's a lovely bit of kit. It's nice to drive, it's responsive. It's like a fighter plane. It really is.
one side leather coming up as well, that's a nice touch. quiet back here. I'm wondering because I'm in the rear cab if there's a sound issue at all. Mm, don't know. See that door opens as well, whereas in this cab, no doors are opening. Nor's the nose end door. So it was, it was a shame that the APTP never got to fulfil its promise of ferrying people up and down the West Coast Mainline at 155 mile an hour. Um, but it isn't the only one to have failed to do this. And if we look at the West Coast Mainline modification programme, that was supposed to be offering uh, the Pendolinos the chance to do 155. So this is us just coming over the top of Shep now. Because Branson was spouting about that, yeah, I'll buy these new tilt trains that will do 155, and he bought those tilt trains, and they didn't do the track up to a good enough standard to get him 155, and didn't upgrade the signalling enough to get him 155. So again, the West Coast Main Line was sold short. The bit that I really like about the APT is it was doing it safely 20 years before the modernisation programme was even started. Tilton trains now, what do we have? We have the 221s that Virgin still own, I think they still tilt the West Coast Main Line sometimes if they go anywhere. And uh, your Pendolinos, and they do definitely tilt. But they use the TAS system, so when they can and can't tilt. Funnily enough, when they were doing the West Coast Main Line route modernisation programme, they were still removing uh, APT beacons from the track. Which I thought was really cool. And when they sort of cancelled the, the main ATP, uh, APTP programme, um, 
the train itself was still used as a test bed for the other 6225 stuff, the Electra Project, Class 91, whatever you want to call it. So some really good research was done with using the ATP, the APT P trains. Somebody's going to go through, probably Mr. Klaus, counting how many times I say ATP instead of APT in this video. Well, then we'll go down to 80 after this as well. And then when they had finished doing all the tests and stuff, they, they ended up sitting in a scrapyard. Lots of them were cut up, but some bits and pieces, and uh, two power cars, I think, two driving trailers, and some intermediate coaches were saved. Um, and were moved to the Crew Heritage Centre when they came out of the scrapyard. Now, for years, these things sat languishing beside the West Coast Main Line, um, I don't know what the Heritage Centre were like before or what their, their sort of setup was, who managed what, but it was in some, some kind of state uh, a good few years ago. And then it seems like a couple of years ago another guy's taken it all over and it's looking stunning. The interior's been done right, uh, it's clean, it's been repainted really nicely done considering this this train was sort of like the test bed the big brother really of, of even the HST and the 91s and the Pendolinos the Pendolino is like the grandchild isn't it Just looking at uh, my RAM limit here, guys. I might have to cut this video short at Penrith. We'll see. No, no, we should. Well, we should make this come up. Yeah, we'll try. We'll make it to Colorado. So I'm going to read you uh, some memories of travel on the APT, on the APTP website. This one is by a guy called uh, Chris Gardner. It was from 1984. That's when he travelled on it. It says here, during the later months of 1984, APT was put to regular service on Glasgow, uh, London, Glasgow diagram as an unadvertised relief. And this went downhill, really, initial. And this guy's saying, I travelled several times in the APT during this period. 
The only way of making a day trip from London was by, take, by taking an early morning train to Crewe and changing there for Preston, arriving in time to catch the APT back to Euston. These were nail bars and expeditions. This was before the era of mobile phones and British Rail never seemed quite sure whether the train would run or not. We had two opportunities to telephone to establish whether the trip was on. Once from Euston before APT was due to leave and Glasgow, due to, leave, due to have left London for Glasgow and once at Crewe whilst changing trains at the point. APT should already have been on her way through where we were once told she was not running because of wheel flats. Sixth Sense guided us to Preston where we found out to our relief she was indeed on her way in from the north. There was the strange ritual at Preston of obtaining a boarding pass. Not the only thing BR borrowed from the airlines during the APT experiment. That's a big wink. Well below 95 anyway, darling, so you don't need to worry at me. No, I've, I've seen what he's going on about eBay. The boarding pass was nothing more than a badly photocopied slip of paper. I'll just slow down to 8 for 75 though. Yeah, the boarding pass was nothing but a badly, more, a badly photocopied slip of paper, but it clearly played an important part in getting us onto the train. BR staff were unashamedly proud of their new toy. It may have been unadvertised relief, but the relish in the announcer's voice of press was obvious. The next train to arrive on Platform 3 will be the advanced passenger train. Service to London, call that da 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 da. Poor APT's wings were well and truly clipped on these runs. She officially limited to 125 mile an hour, restricted by the presence of even slower intercity services just ahead. The pattern of each journey would be lively and indeed slightly bouncy, accelerating from the station to stop 125 mile per hour and over being gained very quickly, followed by an inevitable slowing to 100 once the service and train had caught the train in front. The excitement was there for the first 15 minutes or so after each station. Regrettably, I did not keep my log, but I, know, but I can remember 136 mile an hour being the fastest speed I recorded. This remains the fastest I've ever travelled on BR, the next being 132 miles an hour on HST between Swindon and Reading. The ride was the most exciting I have ever experienced by rail. A bit bouncy as accelerated from stand, but very nippy. Wonderful acceleration and braking, a bit claustrophobic inside, and the tartan work kept was still a bit loud. But still, it was by then completely reliable, and was getting, it was a great tragedy that this wonderful train never saw squadron service. Sad, really, isn't it? Sad. People were clearly very passionate about this train. I can see why I'm quite passionate about it. So there's also an ATPP 30th anniversary trip by uh, Kit Spackman, who was one of the guys that actually worked on the APT project. But it's uh, very, very long.
So 70 miles into Carlisle now. Right. Let me sit my chair up so I'm a little bit closer to the screen and then I will um, read through this one. It's a fair length, but Kit Spaxman is a legend in his own right. Um, and I'd like to uh, get his bit on here. So this is the 30th anniversary trip. It's actually done on a, on a Pendolino. So in 1981, December the 7th, was the day that marked the debut of the ATP and passenger service. And I'd managed to be on the first run southbound from Glasgow Central to Houston in 0700. <clears throat> on a cold winter morning, for the last three years, I'd intended to mark trip by doing the same journey on ATP P's modern day equivalent, Virgin Trains Class 390 Pendolino. 2011 seemed a good year to choose as it was the 30th anniversary and I've spent the last few months working out the various routes and services that would get me to Glasgow and back home again without spending too much money. What's that, me able to go to 120? The purchase of a senior rail car had been a big help in that direction. It turned out that the best solution was to take the Caledonian Sleeper north from Houston the previous day and to catch that I had to take in a Reval lo a Reval a Reval local service from Lydney to Newport and then by First Great Western HST service to Paddington and then a short trip on the underground to Houston for the Sleeper. The return trip would be the same in reverse but considerably faster due to coming south from Pedlina of course. So at 17.17 on Tuesday the 6th I was waiting, oh this is, this is pretty long and wordy um, I might save this for the next video because it's a full trip report and it's more about the Pendolino than it is about the APT and it was one that Kit did himself, it wasn't some sort of pre-arranged thing anyway. This is uh, one by a guy called Ian Johnson on the 7th of December 1981. Just before 0700, passengers were advised of our impending departure by the guard and the plug type sliding doors were closed. As the train gathered speed out of Glasgow, the rapid acceleration was impressive and the riding qualities over the complex crossovers tended to be dominated by a rolling component rather than a vertical movement. Getting away through the suburbs, the speed was well over 100 mile per hour by Uddingston with our first stop at Motherwell, <coughs> scheduled at 13 minutes out of Glasgow. Our arrival was just under 13 minutes after what I can only be described as a unique experience in braking, which demonstrated how effective... Let's take some power off. demonstrate how effective is combined effort of hydrokinetic and conventional brake blending in. in of the conventional brakes as about 50 mile per hour gave one the impression of good control right down to a stand. Getting away smartly from Motherwell, one noted a certain bumpiness which could almost be likened to the sensation of wheel slip. <laughs> Our rapid restart was not sustained since regrettably there had been a signal failure at Carlucky seven and a half miles from Motherwell and we stood for over three minutes before we were allowed to proceed. As a result we passed Carstairs about eight minutes late and then continued up to Beating Summit which was passed nine minutes late at a speed of 117 mile per hour. A wintry dawn was just breaking over Hartfell as we began to descend. Let's get some speed on here. This was to be the first visible experience of the tilt mechanism. With the speeds touching 125, the ride seemed smooth and effortless. The only indication of tilt was seeing the skyline outside rising or falling. Mr. Leslie Soane, General Manager of Scottish Region, announced over the train's communication system that we had reached 125 mile per hour on the run down from the summit. We trundled into Carlisle to a drizzly morning, just under five and a half minutes late. 
some 72 minutes after leaving Glasgow. The climb up to Shap Summit took just over 22 minutes despite the 90 per hour speed restriction at Penrith. A reduction in speed to 20 mile an hour for a PW check at the site of the Shap station. What's a PW check? PW check? Don't know. Uh, as we came barreling down through the Loom Valley, one could sense the coach tilting to a greater degree with speech approaching 125. Eventually we drew up in Preston approximately four minutes late after experiencing once again the technique of rapid braking from 126 at guard zone. Wow. At Preston, crews changed and uh, the Pulmadi driver handed over to his colleague from the London Midland region. Our stop at Preston was more than twice the permitted two minutes. With the guard closing the doors, one or two new passengers seemed slightly confused, <laughs> but there was no doubt about our accelerations. We reached over 100 miles per hour in the four miles to Leyland. The Cheshire plane from Warrington crew was crossed at an average of 110. The running through the Trent Valley was equally as impressive, as it was clear that the clearance had been given to, re to regain some of the lost time. It was under the hour from Preston when we roared through Polesworth, uh, 102.3 miles with speed of around 125 miles per hour. So that by rugby we were just over two minutes early. The fastest speed was still to be experienced. Uh, we'll go down to 100. So yeah, speed was still to be experienced. As for Billsworth, a maximum of 138 mile per hour was recorded and later confirmed. Within the train that th throughout this running, there was no sensation of exceptional speed, although occasionally bad stretch of, a bad stretch of track caused a slight jump. A number of the passengers were interviewed by the media who seemed concerned about our state of health. They were most disappointed when everyone said they enjoyed the run and were not suffering from seasickness. We rolled into Preston just under one minute early, having taken 254 minutes for the overall journey of 401.95, or down below that anyway. For an overall journey of 401 miles, the actual running time of 245 minutes 41 seconds represented an outstanding performance. So Peter Parker was on hand to welcome our arrival and there was a barrage of flash guns as photographers, both amateur and professional, called Event for Posterity. So there we go, with my bad reading. I hope you kind of got that. So everybody seems to mention this sort of bumpy ride when accelerating. It seems to be sort of a rolly bump, it's not like a vertical bump. It's sort of a bit like wheel slip and I'm sure most of you have travelled on trains will have experienced wheel slip at some point. You sort of feel it. It's like a slight judder. So the only APTP left, this is the APTE at Shildon and the ATPP is at the Crew Heritage Centre. Which funnily enough is in Crew. Uh, I thoroughly recommend going and having a look. Get up there, get a look at it. Leave them a little bit of money in the donation box or whatever. It's pretty much a one man band up there with the APTP. Ticket prices are five pounds for an adult, three pounds for a child. So, do you know, not nowhere near, nowhere near bad, is it? And they've got a miniature railway there, model railways there. Uh, 
720 for Carlisle. So as long as they're alongside the APT, they've got um, signal box stuff, all sorts of things. They've got uh, 87, I think, is there. Model railway stuff. They've got a gift shop, crew A signal box. So there's quite a lot to see. North Junction box, crew A signal box, exhibition hall, APT prototype, uh, extra west, west box, miniature railway standing age locomotives, model railway, the NMRA modelers, there's food and drink and there's a gift shop. So yeah, there's quite a lot there. creeping my speed up. So yeah, there's there's just a little bit about the APTP. Uh, do remember there will be more videos along this line. I've got the full manuals for it and everything. And once I've been to visit in real life, I'll be able to go through stuff that I wouldn't understand had I not seen it in real life. And the history of it and everything like that. I've been through bits of it. I just really like it. I don't know what's going on with the sound in this video, that was a bit weird. Um, I'm hoping that there is a sound update for it that lowers the tilt inverter noise plus the air conditioner. I think that's probably a bit loud. But here we are, just pulling into Carlisle nicely. Thank you very much for watching guys, please feel free to like, share and subscribe. Uh, the more you share this about, the more you guys post this about, the more views I get. And the more content I can bring you. So, once again guys, thanks ever so much. And I will catch you next time.